clothing, where you live, all those all those things. Whatever, whatever it is that you need in order to live the life that God has designed for you, He has no problem supply it. Amen. I, I like what one minister who, who's part of a, a, a different camp, he's, he, he, is, he is a spirit-filled believer, but their focus is mainly on... Uh, oh, he, he spends a lot of time on prophetic stuff, which is fine because that's what he's called to. But he, he said, you know... Those of us that are in, in this camp, and I'm not going to tell you what camp he belongs to, but those of us that are in this camp, we ought to be paying more attention to Copeland and those guys because they're flying around in jets and I'm sitting here waiting for one. <laughs> so they're getting something I don't have because I don't understand it. And that's what he said. I don't understand it, and they do, and that's why they can do that, and I can't. Wow. Okay. So then Jesus said, "Therefore, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So, so what, is, what is Jesus saying here? He's, he's saying, look, God knows you, we have issues and he knows that we have needs and we, he knows what we need to do. And, and, let me, and remember that whatever God has designed for your life, it's above you. Because if you can do it, how is God going to get the glory for it? If you can do it on your own, how is God going to get the glory for it? The reason why God answers things, you know, in, in ways that, that surprise us and astound us sometimes is because we're doing what He has asked us to do. And we're not worrying about how is this going to happen. Because if we worry, we cut ourselves off. That's what Jesus said. Okay, so he's talking about how you know, you know, you, you see the headings here. What do they need? What do they want? So Jesus is saying, this is how you get into it. Now, this is what most people want when they. This is what people want from us when they have a situation. They want sympathy, and we need to care. People, want, you know, people all, you know, they get themselves in a fix. Or they get themselves in a situation that they don't know how they're going to deal with it. And, and they want sympathy, and we do need to care. But let me tell you something. Sympathy will not fix the situation. We need to care. We need, we need to show folks that we care. But we need to lead them to Jesus and the answer that he provides, like right here. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. God will take care of it. How? I don't know. That's not my job. That's God's job. But we need to get you over into faith so God can. Did you hear me? We need to get you over into faith so God can take care of your situation. As long as you want people, you know, patting, patting on you and, and weeping with you and stuff like that, you ain't going to find a solution. Because heaven don't operate that way. Heaven operates in faith, believing that God will do it. Amen? So people want sympathy, but, and, and we do need to care but we need to always be careful to lead them back to the Word of God. What did Jesus say that we ought to be doing? Well, he said, don't worry. Well, so that's an indication of something to us. So when we're trying to lead some people into the direction of the Lord where he can help them, we need to get across to them that this worry thing is not going to help. I understand, you know, we all, we all have, you know, the Bible says that all temptations are common to man. Isn't that right? That means we all experience the same things. Not the same things in particular, but the same things. We've all, have, we've all been rejected. We've all been hurt. We've all been sick. Right? We've all come to the end of the month and not enough money and stuff like that. You know, we've all had these kinds of things go on. So we, we have, maybe not to the extent that somebody else has, but we still have. We have that. So we can, we can show that we care because we know what that means. Okay? So we, but we, but that's not the answer. The answer is always found in the Word of God. It's not found in, you know, I care about you. They need to know that or they won't listen to you. Amen? I care, they need to know that or they won't listen to you. So, so, so we need to show people in the Word of God that, that God loves them and wants to help them. He loves them and He wants to help them. And, and we need to show them, you know, because a lot of times people have been dealing with things for a long time. 
And it just keeps, you know, it, it's something that comes up. And it, it could be, it can be a money thing, it can be a family thing, it can be a sickness thing. It just, whatever old thing it is. And it just, you know, keeps cropping back up. And, and so a lot of times people develop the idea that, well, because I've been dealing with this for a long time, I just have to deal with it. No, you don't. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus did not say that. Jesus didn't say you just have to, you know, bear your own burden. If then, if you if you do that, you're denying what he did on the cross. That's not a good thing to do. Anything, anytime we get outside of the word of God, we're going to suffer for it. Amen. We will suffer for the things that he has provided. He we will suffer when we do not obtain the things he has provided for us. You know, like I told you, I went for years not knowing that I could be free of allergies. Even though I was a Christian, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, but I didn't know how to make it work. Amen. I didn't know how to delight myself in his healing concerning my body. Do you know why my body suffers from allergies? Because it's in my DNA. It was, I should say it that way. It was in my DNA. It didn't come from my dad's side, it came from my mom's side. She's allergic to everything, where she used to be. I don't know what she's like now, but just, you know, grass on this, dust, wind, I mean, everything bothered her. And so that part of her DNA got into me, you know, because I'm her child. Just because it's in your DNA doesn't mean you have to live with it. You can change your DNA. Where does it say that in the Bible? Well, God, when God brings healing to your body, what do you think he's fixing in part? He's fixing something about your body that's not lined up. The reason why I used to suffer allergies is because there was something about my body that was not lined up concerning how my body ought to behave. My body's not, well, we're not supposed to be allergic to this and that and the other thing and you know, coughing and sneezing, all the stuff I used to do, it was awful. The only thing that sickness ever taught me is it's no good, and I don't like it. Amen. So, so what we do, we lead people into the direction of God's Word. We show them how to believe. You know, if you just say God loves you and He wants to heal you, that doesn't, that's not enough information to get anybody anywhere. I mean, it's information they need to know, but we need to show them how. Okay? Remember Matthew 18, 19, if two agree is touching anything on earth, it'll be done for them. You gotta, if you're going to pray for somebody along those lines, you've got to get them to agree with you. If they're not in agreement, it ain't going to work. Is that right? Because Jesus said if two will agree, he, so in other words, in order for me to agree with Pam, she's got to have understanding of what I'm thinking, I have to have understanding of what she's thinking, or we're not in agreement. Now we may think we are, you know, have you, we've had that happen before, right? We think we're in agreement, and we'll pray, and we're like, huh, nothing happened. Hmm. Well, I know I was believing. <laughs> Amen? That kind of thing? You know you are, but you don't know about the other person. Well, what does that mean? Just forget about it? No, go back to them and show them. Okay? Go back to them and show them and believe God with them. See, we want everyone to see God work in their lives. That's one of the design, that is one of the core functions of it. That's why we have this as a scripture. That's one of the reasons. We boldly approach the throne of grace to find help in our time of need, right? We all need help sooner or later. So we need to be showing people how God works in their lives because we want people to be blessed. So I, I am believing that God is going to do wonderful things concerning this fellowship in 2019. And one of the things that... that uh, I want to see God do in this year is I want to see God bring people out of financial distress in this area. 
because you don't have to look around very hard in this area. You don't have to look around very hard almost anywhere as, as far as that goes. But, but in this area, you don't have to look around very hard to find people that are in financial distress. It's easy to find. Amen? What about healing? Oh, that's, that's a given. We want people to be healed too. But, but you know, when, when the problem is so gigantic, I, I've noticed that a lot of people can walk around with some kind of illness and they'll still do a kind of a decent job serving the Lord. Maybe a good job in a lot of other ways. You understand what I'm saying? But when they have financial problems, man, it stops them dead in their tracks. They quit coming to church. They quit fellowshipping. All kinds of horrible things happen because, you know, just can't make it. I saw this in a movie, and just because it's in a movie doesn't mean it's true. But, it, it, you know, the more I think about it, the more I think it is true. It said uh, these two guys are trapped out in the wilderness. And... Uh, one of the fellows, he, he had a huge general knowledge. He just read books all the time. Just, you know, you could ask him almost anything and he knew something about it. And he's telling the other guy, they're out in the wilderness in Alaska. He tells the other guy, the reason, he goes, you know, the reason why people die in the wilderness is not because of animals or, or frostbite or something like that. It's because they give up. They give up. And I, I've noticed with believers, too, that the, oftentimes the reason why people don't get things from God is because they give up. We want to help them. We want to help them. We don't want to give up on them. Amen? We want people to be healed. We want people to be delivered. We want people to be shown how they can receive things from God. You know, the thing that God showed me concerning 2019 is, you know, that there will be great victories if his people will pray. Well, when people are busy dealing with their own issues, they don't pray. Not very much. They might pray about their issues, but they don't pray about anybody else's or anybody else's thing. And, not, and they're not really looking to, to be involved with helping people out concerning the Lord because... Their problem is too big. We don't want that. Not that we don't want the problems. We don't want people to be stuck in those problems. We don't want people to be stuck in those problems. So one of the things that I want us to do as a church is to begin to pray Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3 over this fellowship. Ephesians 1 and Ephesians Ephesians 3. You don't, have to, you don't have to name every name. If God puts somebody on your heart, that's fine. But we need to pray those prayers over this fellowship because they, you know, there are any number of people that, that come here that you know, and we, we, I could name names and you know what I'm talking about. That, that They're facing some kind of a deal and their problem is just so big and one of the reasons why you see them hitting and missing in church is because their problem is bigger than their God. I'm not saying that in a mean way. It's just true. Their problem is bigger than their God. And, and because of the shame of that, they don't show up. Yes, sir. Well, you, you pray it in first person. So, in other words, you you say, for this, uh, I bow my knees to the Lord Jesus Christ, of the, in whom the whole family in Kirkland is named. Not heaven and earth, because you, you, we're praying, for, you know, first person, okay, and then you just run down through it, okay. So we we want to pray these things because we want this church to. Be a church that people look to and go, man, I don't know about, I don't know all about them folks over there, but God is working and moving there. Not because we want accolades, but we want people to know that they can get help from heaven. We want, you know, a lot of people stop at the cross. That's where you're supposed to start, not stop. 
Amen. We need to keep going because all the benefits are on the other side. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You got something, Pam? Yes. That whatever is going on, yes, we do responsibility, but we want you to know that we're standing with you. God is yes. standing with you, and you can act upon that with all faith and all strength and all understanding, and you're going to be a help with you. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So, Father, we just thank you that. Concerning this year, we're going to see heaven poured out upon this place. We're going to see your revelation poured out upon this place. Lord, we're going to see people come into the knowledge of you as they never have before because their minds are being enlightened. Lord, we thank you that people are going to go into places in you because their spirits are being enlightened. Lord, we thank you that people are going to come and receive from Jesus such as never before in their lives because the knowledge and the understanding that they needed will be presented. And Lord, that that this fellowship will stand with and, and walk alongside so that people can enter in to the precious things that you have for them. That Lord, people will come into the understanding of who they are and and what they are and what their place is in the body of Christ. That it will no longer be a a, a mystery to them. But Lord, they will know and they will be, they will know and they will understand and Lord, that they will grasp a hold of that. They will walk in that and live in that. And because of that, that fitly joining together that you speak of, Lord, that the, the joints and the, and the ligaments and, and, and all the body parts fitting together, one supplying to the other, effectually will be done here in this place in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, give us understanding so that we can work with one another to help guide and and place people in the place that they ought to be. To work with them. To grow with them. Because we're all growing together in you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you're going to help us in powerful ways in this year. Thank you, Lord, for making this a strong and healthy fellowship. Thank you, Lord, We're doing this thing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I just feel like that uh, over the last couple of years that there's been some folks that have come and gone just kind of like testing the water and that God is going to draw some of those folks back. And uh, there is place for them. That's why they were testing the water. But oftentimes when people test the water, they're leery. And you don't just dive off the bank, you don't know what's down there. Not if you got any sense. And I, I believe that God is going to draw in. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I also feel like the Lord is saying that he's going to firm people up in, in positions that are already here. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Not everybody's who they think they are. <laughs> but they're going to know. They're going to know. Okay, this is my spot. And it's important. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Also, we're going to uh, we're we're going to open the door a little more to having guest speakers and cooperating with some of the churches in the area. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. That's all I got. You got something? Awesome. That's good. In, in September 1950, Brother Hagen was having a meeting, and uh, uh, he was in a tent meeting, and uh, he had called called people up to, you know, not an altar call for salvation, but you know how people come up and pray around the altar, that kind of thing. And so he, he turned, and he was going to kneel down and pray himself, but when he turned, the top of the tent disappeared and he saw Jesus standing up about where the top of the tent would be. And he said, come up hither, come up hither. And so they had a conversation that lasted about an hour or so, a little over an hour. And uh, it was very interesting to the congregation or the folks that were there because they could hear Brother Hagin, but they couldn't hear Jesus. <laughs> but, you know, so he's having a one-sided conversation. They didn't, you know, this, so it sounded kind of funny. But one of the things that Jesus told him in this meeting, and it was in Rockwall, Texas, was he was, he was uh, showing him how to deal with devils and demons. And, and so uh, one of the things that he said uh, that was going to happen, he took his, his right hand and laid it in, in each palm of Brother Hagin's hands. He took his fingers and put, put them in his hands. And he said it began to burn like somebody put coals in his hands. And, and uh, he said... From now on, what is known as the operation of discerning the spirits is going to operate in your life. He said, but when, when you're praying for people, one of the things you can do is you put one hand on the front and one hand on the back. And if you, if you sense that fire jumping back and forth, then you know the problem is not sickness, it's, it's demonic. So you command the demon to leave. So a couple of months goes by, and he's at this service, and there's a guy there. He's got, um, 
I never even heard of this before. He had uh, uh, tuberculosis of the spine. But what it meant was his, his spine was just ramrod straight, and he couldn't bend over. He could barely move his head, so he couldn't bend over at all. Just you know, very straight. And so he, this man, come up for prayer, and so he puts his hand on the front, hand on the back, feels fire jump back and forth. So he commands that devil, that demon, to leave. You know, he says it's not sickness; it's a de it's demonic power that's causing you to be this way. And he commanded it to leave. He said, uh, and then he said. Uh, See if you can touch your toes. If. And so uh, the man tried to do it. He could just barely move his head. couldn't do anything. So he put his hands on the front and pan on the back. And the fire jumped back and forth. And, he, and uh, yep, it's a demon, all right. So he backs up and he, and, he, and he commands that demon to leave. And he says, OK, see if, see if you can touch your toes. If. You can touch your toes. And the man couldn't do anything. He goes, well, OK, go ahead and sit down. And he started to go to the next person. And he, and he noticed somebody standing next to him. And he turned and looked. And Jesus was standing right there. He said, and Jesus stuck out his hand. And his tip of his finger it almost touched his nose. He said, I told you in the meeting in Rockwall, Texas, that when you command a demon to leave, it must go. And he said, Lord, I know what you said. I was right there. I heard every word. But it doesn't want to go. And Jesus raised his hand up again. He said, I told you in that meeting in Rockwall, Texas, that when you command a demon to leave, it must go. And he said, Lord, I know. I was standing right there. I heard every word. I, just a couple of months ago, I remember it just like it was, you know, yesterday. But it doesn't want to go. And Jesus stuck his finger in his nose again. He said, I told you, now more fervent, when you command a demon to leave, it must go. And he said, Lord, I know what you said to me. I was standing right there, and I tried to do it, but it didn't leave. And Jesus looked at him a little differently, he said, I think I know what that, you know, that end time Jesus looks like now. A little lightning flash is coming out of his eyes. And he said, yes, but I said it would. So he said, called the man, hey, come back up here. See, he'd gotten over into unbelief and he didn't know it. If, see, if you can. So then he got the man up there again. He commanded that demon to leave and he said now bend over and touch your toes and the man bent over just like he never had a problem in his life just like that well it's easier to respond after Jesus gets in your face that's true but you see what I'm saying now if Jesus hadn't appeared to brother Hagen he wouldn't have known what he did wrong. He wouldn't have known that little bitty two, two letters screwed the whole thing up. Therefore, we don't allow ourselves to fall into unbelief also when we're trying to help somebody else. Yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, our, our first pastor, he used to say, do what you couldn't do. That's the right way to say something. Do what you couldn't do before.
Yeah. So, sometimes we can help people by like, for, I was uh, I was out hunting with a friend of mine one time, and and he he was snorting and coughing and all this, and I said, "What's the matter with you?" And and uh, he said, "Oh, I got flu or something." I said, "No." I said, "Well, have you come against it?" Because he'd been under my ministry for a while, and, and he, yeah, yeah, he just can't seem to shake it. <laughs> so, I'm laughing because I wouldn't say that to my, if my pastor said something to me like that. I wouldn't say yeah, but I can't. <laughs> I'd I'd say something different, but I wouldn't I wouldn't admit that I couldn't get past it, you know. So, anyways, I said, well, as long as you're in as long as you're in the vehicle, with, as long as you're with the vehicle with me, you won't be doing that. You won't be sniffing and snorting and all that stuff. I said, first of all, because I don't want you that way, and second secondly, I don't like listening to it, so you're not going to do it. And so we're running around, and he's, you know, he's not snorting and sniffing and coughing and stuff like that. We'd step out of the vehicle, and he'd start up again. He'd get out, you know, shoot at something, and get back in the truck, and he's, <laughs> and I'd say, no, you're not doing that. And he'd, I was trying to show him. Yes, I was trying to show him you can take control of this. Okay. But he never did get it that day. He went home snorting and sniffing and all that, and he didn't have any reason to. All he had to do was grab a hold of it. Say, okay, no matter where I'm at, it's going to stay with me. Amen. But I didn't say, well, you know, I didn't say something like, well, what's wrong with you? You know, you got sick later. You was with me. <laughs> that doesn't help anybody. <laughs> Alrighty then.